Ich habe schon öfter erwähnt, dass ich, als ich angefangen habe, bei Facebook zu arbeiten, an einem gewissen Imposter-Syndrom litt, weil die Leute da teilweise echt zu krass drauf sind. Und jetzt habe ich mir gedacht, lade ich doch einfach einen dieser krassen Menschen mal in meinen Podcast ein. Mein heutiger Gast und ich waren damals gemeinsam Facebook-Praktikanten und haben dann auch später zeitgleich bei Facebook in Vollzeit angefangen. Er ist ein absoluter Überflieger, hat seinerzeit Indien bei der Internationalen Informatik-Olympiade vertreten und arbeitet inzwischen im Künstliche Intelligenz. Forschungsteam von Facebook. Das ist übrigens ein sehr spannender Karriereweg, denn er arbeitet wie ein Forscher an der Uni. Er fährt auf Konferenzen, er veröffentlicht wissenschaftliche Paper, er wird vielleicht irgendwann mal Professor, aber das alles im Moment eben auf Facebook-Gehaltsniveau. Echt mega interessant, was er alles aus seinem Arbeitsalltag und seiner Forschung berichtet. Außerdem ging es am Ende noch ein bisschen um seine Cambridge-Bewerbung und um gute alte Zeiten. Ich hoffe, es gefällt euch. Viel Spaß mit der heutigen Folge. Hello Pushka, welcome to my living room and most importantly, welcome to my podcast. It is an absolute pleasure. Man, I gotta say, normally I, so most of, most of the times, in most episodes, I had YouTubers, mm -hmm. social media people. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit easier to work with them because they know all this stuff, they have like camera equipment, they have done this a couple of times. Mm. But recently people have texted me and they've commented that they actually prefer mm. non-influencers. They find it more relatable, they actually like it when I bring mm. in friends, random colleagues, people from mm. university. So I'm trying to do more episodes like this. However, the challenge being that uh, most people are a bit hesitant to actually mm. go in front of camera. So I had this engineering manager recently from my team and I actually had to ask him for like multiple months for him to come on and he was really nervous. Mm. You, on the other hand, I texted you. I was like, please, mate, come on my podcast. You, or would you like to come on my podcast? And you were like, yes, when and where, let me know. Let's fix a date right now. You were like, as if you had been waiting for it. <laughs> what, like, how come? Like, what, what, what's going on there? Like, I really like your channel, Nicholas. That's the thing. I think um, you're doing good work. And I thought um, contributing to it in any way or form Would be a would be a good idea. You don't speak German though. It's, I don't it's flattering, but it would be more flattering if you actually spoke the language. I I, I swear. I, I I thought maybe in the month you gave me, I thought I'll pick up some words. Um, you know, just to just to make sure I'm appropriate. But I couldn't manage that, uh, unfortunately. But I think um, this will still be fun without it. Definitely, definitely. So Pushka. Uh, mm -hmm. you studied at Cambridge mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about it, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know each other at Cambridge. We, we met know. at the Facebook internship, summer That's 2017, I believe. That is correct. And I distinctly remember meeting you for the first time mm -hmm. because I sometimes mention on my channel that like coming into Facebook for the first time, doing this kind of internship for the first time, I had a bit of an imposter syndrome. I was like, wow, all these people are like really smart, like really advanced programmers. And you are the, you were one of the first people to contribute to that because I remember like, you know, when, when all the interns gathered in this room, we were like 50 people and there was mm. this guy doing like this hype speech, like welcome to Facebook. Yeah. And uh, everyone gathered and like getting to know each other. And people would do like this small talk and there was a bit of this kind of like asserting dominance and talking about like oh tech stuff and like what's your favorite programming language. And you asked like multiple people, you like went around and asked people if they were into co competitive coding. Oh, like I you, did. Yeah, yeah. You actually like well, you, you're trying to talk about it. like, yeah. Who does like competitive programming? What's your right. experience? I was like, competitive coding. I barely knew what that meant mm. at the time. I never even dabbled with that mm. at all. So I was like, wow, these guys, they are like all like crazy competitive programmers. So what am I doing here? So maybe let's start there. Actually, what is and and remember, you're speaking to a broad audience. Some sure. some of them are computer scientists, but not mm. all of them. Sure. What is this? competitive coding thing and how did you get into it and what did you get out of it? That's a great question. And, you know, so to answer this, I'll take you back to my high school days. Right? Oh, okay. So up till 10th grade. So I, I did my high school back in Delhi. Uh, and in Delhi, like, you know, in, um, in Indian schools, you have like 12 grades of study. So in 10th grade, up till 10th grade, I was pretty sure I had nothing to do with computer science. I did not want to do computer science. I did not associate myself with it. I wanted to be probably a mechanical engineer. Um, I, I, I was on kind of, you know, preferred um, preferred more of hands-on engineering than 
what I considered more hands-on engineering than computer science. Mm. So computer science was not my thing. Um, Then I came to 11th grade and that's when uh, things become a bit more focused and I just picked up computer science as one of my five subjects to do in high school, uh, 11th grade. Um, And that's when it actually started getting interesting um, when I entered this kind of um, area of algorithms, you know, algorithms and data structures and... Um, competitive coding is like um, this this kind of um, uh, you know is this area of of programming where we we are just kind of uh, working with algorithms and data structures to solve problems um, that have certain time constraints space constraint uh, space constraints and we are trying to do it in like um, a set amount of time so it's like a problem solving competition except um, instead of doing like on paper, you're writing algorithms to solve problems and you're given some test cases, some um, some data sets on which uh, this algorithm should run and produce outputs and, uh, you know, it should match the, uh, match the ideal outputs and so on. So that's what kind of really, these are programming competitions. So it's like turning programming into a sport kind yes. of. Yes, yes. Is it done in presence? Because, I mean... I suppose it can be done like these kind of challenges can also be done over the internet, but like the real championships, Mm -hmm. the uh, informatics Olympiad, Mm -hmm. uh, is this done in person? Do you people gather around like some Mm -hmm. computers? I have this scene in mind, Mm -hmm. you know, the film, the social network, right? This is not a competitive coding scene, but there's this scene where they they do the interview for Facebook. They have like a bunch of people around a table kind of like hacking and solving some challenge. Right. Is, Is it like that? Yeah, yeah. A lot of competitions. So a lot of competitions, like when they start, um, they're they're online, like, you know, the entry levels and the qualification levels. But ultimately, you know, for both uh, both like college level and high school level, you have like uh, Informatics Olympiad, the International uh, Olympiad in Informatics that is in person. And you have the ACM ICPC, uh, which is also in person. So they, they arrange it and you go to this like it's a giant room where like people are sitting uh, it's a lot of lot of typing noises, and it's like it's really overwhelming. But uh, it's not as close to that scene because you know they they take shots of beer whenever they get something right. Uh, we don't have those in sport programming, but but yeah, it's it's like that. We do have physical competitions, um, at, at least at the highest level for sure. And would you say there's a strong correlation be- between someone being a good software engineer in mm-hmm. the industry and someone being good at this, or is it quite a niche skill to be good at competitive coding? I I absolutely uh, love that question, and a lot of times people do ask me uh, ask me that since I was a sport programmer. Um, but I would say, to an extent, yes, um, there is a certain level of advantage that you have when you come from this kind of a background into software engineering. But does it always um, correlate to, let's say, uh, being a successful software engineer? That I wouldn't say um, is necessarily strongly true. Um, I do feel people with this background do have some advantage because they're like kind of, um, they have an advantage uh, in terms of like problem solving. But then software engineering is not just problem solving, right? Like it's a lot of aspects. Um, uh, So yeah, so one aspect, you have an advantage, other aspects you still need to deliver on uh, regardless. That's really interesting. I mean, it certainly seemed like it should be it should be an advantage in the interview anyway. And mm. also during the internship, um, it seemed like it would be an advantage to be kind of like very fluent in maybe various programming languages and just being quick at solving these kind of challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, and you certainly did like a really fast progression. I think <laughs> you really nailed the internship. And you, would you say it was related to that or was it the skills that you specifically needed to succeed uh, at Facebook, for example, in the software engineering internship, or was it very different? So yeah, so that's a great point. It definitely helped with the interview process. I would I would um, definitely say that because interview process, problem solving is a big uh, aspect of it. That certainly helps. During the internship, it did, he- one, it definitely helped with my confidence in approaching the internship because, mm. you know, you come with this background where, you know, you're kind of, you've done problem solving in the algorithmic space and especially the kind of internship I was doing, which was more of, exploratory work trying to do um, design better search algorithms for Facebook search. Um, so yeah, so that's a bit of like, you know, understanding graph algorithms, implementing them. Um, and that was that was definitely, I mean, my project definitely benefited from this experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
it uh, it could also have been that it did not necessarily benefit but i do feel at least the confidence part um definitely comes from this and if you have a project that aligns well with problem solving uh, and algorithms or kind of exploratory things um it helps there as well and i i say that because and well, I don't know. I hope you're comfortable. Are you to- comfortable talking about kind of a bit about like your Facebook career? Yeah, let's well. do it. Um, so, uh, because I, I remember like we, so we did the internship together mm-hmm. and then we came back together. We started we at the same date. Right. Um, I was a data engineer. You started as a software mm-hmm. engineer. And then of course we talked how things went. And I think you had like an extraordinarily good start at Facebook, if I remember. If you if you don't mind me sharing that. No, please So go. there's like, Every six months at Facebook, you get a rating and you can meet the expectations, which is not bad. It means like mm-hmm. the expectations are very high. So it's really mm-hmm. good if you're like doing well. Mm-hmm. Um, you can also go below that, of course, if you're struggling. Right. But then there's like, you can get a rating exceeds expectations. Mm-hmm. You can get a rating greatly exceeds expectations, mm-hmm. which I got and was very happy with. Mm-hmm. But then there's also rating redefines expectations, which ki- kind of means that what this person did uh, really set like the bar for future generations and it like was kind of out of the world and like mm-hmm. so much better than what was expected mm-hmm. that's what you got in your first rating and you got immediately promoted to another uh, right. salary salary level so yes. how like what was it was this a competitive program was it something else what would you say how why did you kick this out of the park <laughs> like uh, so so quickly when joining the company i think i think it was a mix of things nicholas to be very honest um Competitive coding, yes. Um, a part of it, again, um, attrib- I would attribute it to the problem-solving part. Um, another thing I would say um, that really helped me was some of the experience I gathered, um, uh, the research experience I gathered in the final year of university. So uh, last year of uh, Cambridge, when you're doing a computer science tripos, as we call them, right? So uh, our bachelor's uh, courses are called tripos. We have three years of, of, of study. So in the final year of computer science, and this is computer science, uh, not computer engineering. So we have like two two courses at Cambridge. But in computer science, which is like kind of more theoretically uh, motivated, um, you have this final year, you do a bachelor's thesis uh, and you can pick your topic, uh, whatever you want to do, um, as long as, you know, you, you lay down the topic and the milestones and it's approved and all of that. So I chose a topic that was um, uh, NLP, natural language processing, which was my interest after um, I, I finished my Facebook internship in 2017 and went back for my final year, I was really kind of getting interested in in uh, natural language processing and machine learning. So I picked up this topic for bachelor's thesis, which was about um, automated abuse detection, you know, so detection of abusive language in social media uh, using artificial intelligence and specifically using natural language processing. And I did my bachelor's thesis and... This thesis went on to get the best thesis award uh, from the department. And I got uh, two publications out of it. And that was kind of really something that really put me on this path. Because when I returned to Facebook, I joined this team which was working on uh, kind of integrity problems. And you know, integrity was a big thing back. And it still is a big thing, but it was especially growing at that time. So I think all of that together, research experience, competitive coding, this gave me an edge that I do think turned out to be redefined expectations interesting i mean i think even at uni i mean at university level it, mm-hmm. even at cambridge it is not normal to have two publications just in your bachelor's degree like you are not like as a bachelor's student you aren't normally supposed or expected right. to advance science right. right you don't have to do a uh, research that is innovative in any, mm-hmm. in any means you can just like mm-hmm. summarize stuff do papers mm-hmm. like do your exercises understand everything well mm. be a good student but uh, getting like publications out in the bachelor is even at Cambridge seems like not normal so that's great and you also did an internship before Facebook which must have helped you were at Microsoft Research yes, yes. Um, did what what did you do at Microsoft Research was it a similar area no so Microsoft Research um, there I was working on uh, kind of you know uh, we have data centers and we want to put as much of data into these data centers but at the same time, uh, you want to reduce the power that a data center consumes. So how can you get data into a data center? And when you want to retrieve that data, if you could just spin up a certain percentage of this and get your data, uh, that would be power efficient. And that's what um, we were designing and 
talking of competitive coding and algorithms, my first internship was really kind of uh, benefited from competitive coding because we were trying to design these uh, layout, um, kind of graph layouts of data centers, which would be efficient, you know, so network flow problems. And uh, having done competitive coding, problem solving in this area of network flow, graph algorithms, it really helped kind of gave me perspectives that other people without such a background would um, would not immediately, you know, manage to see how to how to optimize certain things. Interesting. I, I, I feel like there's a lot of coherence in your, I mean, in terms of topics in mm -hmm. your career. Like mm -hmm. even already in the bachelor's, you said you were getting into AI and yes. not just AI, but natural language processing and abusive behavior on social media. Yeah. And this is precisely the area you work in at Facebook at the moment. You did like another thing that's not really normal, which is really interesting for us other colleagues to observe because mm -hmm. uh, there are all these like rules and kind of typical ways, even at the kind of, Facebook is more, it's like a flexible company, but we mm. still have like levels and like a certain system and think how mm. things work. You mm. joined the company as a software engineer, but then very, very soon you actually transitioned to being a research scientist or an applied researcher. Yeah. And uh, this is really interesting because on my channel, I often talk about different career Mm. paths as a mm. computer scientist and some people i interviewed people who are university professors mm. and of course there's like especially as a computer scientist many people have this this option they either go into academic research mm. uh, or they go into industry and get paid usually a lot more right and it, it the choice to go into academia as a computer scientist is i feel a bit tougher than mm. for some other disciplines because we have facebook salaries google salaries waiting now you mm -hmm do actually do research, mm -hmm. you have publications, are you work kind of like someone would as you at university, mm -hmm. but for a Facebook salary. I actually, I actually checked like you did like even like four or five papers already this year. Mm -hmm. So I was yeah. looking you up and I was saying, wait, this guy, he works at Facebook. You got like all of these mm -hmm. kind of university looking publications. You had like, for example, I just clicked on one. It was an, a paper on ethics and yes. explainability mm -hmm. with Helen Yanakudakis and mm -hmm. Ekaterina Shutova. Yes. And they are not at Facebook. They're not at Facebook. They are actually university researchers. Yes. And you wrote a paper together. And I also couldn't help but notice that they had a Cambridge background. So I was wondering if there's some personal connection that you used to to get into that. So tell me about this and tell me about the general, like how does that work? How can you like do university research while being employed at Facebook? This is an amazing question. And I'm going to tell you some things that probably people don't know about. And uh, this is something that I really encourage everyone to do it, uh, you know, especially in research roles at Facebook. Uh, so talking of Helen and um, Katya, E. Katrina Shutova, they were they were my uh, supervisors for my bachelor's thesis mm. back at the uh, back at Cambridge. So that's how I know them. Uh, and uh, Katya, she moved uh, to University of Amsterdam. Uh, she's uh, she's now um, there and she's leading the NLP lab there. And Helen moved to King's College uh, London after that, and she's she's also kind of leading an NLP lab here. Um, because uh, one of the reasons, of course, like, you know, diversifying, uh, like in uh, academia, it's very important to diversify yourself, like go to different places, go to different universities, because you don't want to encourage inbreeding of of uh, kind of, you know, research um, directions and all of that. So it's very important for academics to keep moving. Also, it's very hard to kind of, you know, uh, it's very hard to just progress through academic career at Cambridge because it's extremely competitive. Um, and getting to professorship and full professorship at Cambridge is very hard. So people want to diversify their portfolios in many other institutions before they go back and, you know, kind of take up more senior roles at Cambridge. Um, because then you have higher chances of, you know, kind of coming with a diverse portfolio. So that's how I know them. And they're, they've been amazing collaborators for quite a while now, like three years. Talking of how I still collaborate with them, that's a great question. And first I'll answer your your question on how I switched to research um, at Facebook. Uh, so as you said, I came back as a software engineer because I was a software engineering intern, but I came in with publications and there was this team like kind of, you know, looking for these uh, skills specifically and my publications were like, um, very interestingly, you know, like one topic that has always interested me is graphs. I absolutely love graphs as a topic um, and 
um, just just to be clear, I'm talking about you know uh, the, the graphs with nodes and edges, not the not the bar graphs and pie charts and all that. So networks, networks, yes. So exactly. So networks and uh, these kind of uh, network processes and um, uh, th- this area uh, has interested me quite a bit. Uh, like I've I've always been fascinated by this. And my internship, Facebook internship, was um, also a bit around this because we were trying to improve search uh, using kind of, you know, graph-based techniques of, of kind of finding, uh, like, you know, word graph finding similar words, right? And even before that, in Microsoft Research, I was doing this, as I told you, you know, kind of planning this data center layout, which was, again, kind of a network problem. Right. And by the way, my mm. one, my own, my own, my one and only publication. Yes, you told my me. only scientific publication is on graph learning. As yes, well. so. exactly. And so when I came back, uh, and my publications on abuse detection, they were about the same. Like, how can you use the network structure to better reason about what people post and what they believe in? And you know, you'll discover that there are pockets of people who are very uh, intricately linked who believe in certain things, and it's not the whole network that believes in. Uh, abusing or racism or these kind of things. There are pockets that are uh, homophilic, you know, they have similar ideologies, they have similar language of communication. And that's what we, uh, you know, there are so many different things that happen in a network and it's it's, it's great to analyze them using machine learning, right? Um, so that's what I was working on and this team was trying to, um, so this team, Facebook, um, bought out this company called uh, uh, Bloomsbury AI, which was uh, an NLP lab in London, and they, that's how Facebook AI London was created. Uh, so that was uh, in August of 2018. Is it part of FAIR, Facebook AI Research? Is yes. that the same thing? Yes, yes. So Facebook AI Research is a part of Facebook AI, uh, the whole organization. So do you mm-hmm. transitively report to Jan LeCun? Uh, so Jan LeCun used to be, now he is oh, he's switched not anymore. To, yeah, he has switched to more of an advisory role. He's the chief okay. AI scientist now. Okay. And Jerome Pacenti is our new operational VP. Okay. Uh, because I, when, I always thought that's really cool because he's like one of the founding fathers or the yeah, founding yeah. father of Convolution and Neural Networks. Yes, he is. Who is leading AI research yes, at Facebook. Yes, like how yes. cool is that? And that's showing how this kind of symbiosis of industry and right. scientific research, which... Sorry, exactly. you're going to continue. To no, that's about. that's actually correct. So he stepped down in 2018 and Jerome took over and he moved to a more of like an advisory and kind of technical direction kind of role and management moved to Jerome. Um, but yeah, but that's uh, that's exactly that. So I, when I came back, uh, this team was just starting out and they were given this charter of working on misinformation. And misinformation at Facebook, um, you know, is kind of inherently a network problem because you need to understand how information propagates to be able to deem something misinformation or not, because nothing in isolation is misinformation, very rarely, and anything put in any context where it doesn't belong is misinformation. So um, so that's how they were looking for the person like this, and they happened, so I had some um, people I knew on this team who were also on the search team before when I interned, um, and they kind of arranged a talk between me and the new manager, and the new manager said, like, why don't you present your work that you've been working on and we can take it from there if we like the work. Um, and that's how research scientists are actually hired at Facebook, which is like you have to come and present your work to a panel. And then the panel, of course, writes reviews about you, about your work, about your research direction, about your, um, about how you, you uh, like kind of, you know, if your research has novelty, if your research has has kind of uh, impact on, on, on real world problems. That's how we have the um, uh, research scientist hiring, which also includes one coding interview, but this is the major part of it, which is like uh, the research presentation. So I did that presentation and um, the team happened to like it quite a bit because it was um, touching upon topics of graph neural networks, which were kind of very hot at that time. And I had experience with them and graph learning, as you said, uh, machine learning on graphs. So that's how I got into, uh, got into, you know, the, the the the, um, uh, the scene of of this team, and eventually um, they they decided to hire me, and that's how I switched from software engineering to research. Got it. That's really interesting. So, um, being a researcher like this, mm-hmm. um, talk a bit more about like what's the work really like? Because so I mm-hmm. see, so you work at Facebook, but you have these publications yes. that you yes. do. So what 
do you, how close, how similar is what you do? Is it more similar to someone else working at Facebook? Or is it more similar to someone working at university? Mm -hmm. And how free are you in mm -hmm. your research? Like Facebook mm -hmm. is kind of sponsoring this, but you are, you are, are you solving problems directly or kind of indirectly by just contributing to the space that Facebook is interesting in? How does it work? That's a great question. And to understand that, uh, we have to understand how Facebook AI is organized, right? So Facebook AI is this organization that uh, kind of, you know, is is for, of course, advancing the state of AI, but also like helping Facebook with, um, with products and using AI for betterment of these products for our users, right? And so... Um, th there is a part of Facebook that is uh, devoted to kind of theoretical research, you know, advancing the core of um, core of AI, kind of uh, core of machine learning and, and other parts of AI. Um, then there are parts that focus on applying AI to products and improving the products using AI. So that's kind of more of what we call applied research, right? So there is Facebook AI research, which is pure uh, uh, pure research, then we have uh, AI applied research, which is more about like uh, applying that kind of AI research that we do to products. And there are other parts that are working on kind of building uh, what we know as PyTorch today, which is like frameworks and libraries for open sourcing and internal usage. And we have responsible AI, which is about kind of helping Facebook um, kind of move in a direction where we are using our AI responsibly and kind of developing AI techniques that are privacy safe and, you know, fairness um, compliant and so on. Um, so in those terms, um, Facebook AI offers a lot of freedom for what you want to work on. Uh, Facebook AI works on a range of topics all the way from, you know, convolutional neural networks, which was the brainchild of Jan LeCun, uh, all the way to uh, many NLP areas, reinforcement learning, um, graph learning and, and um, you know, natural language processing. We have amazing scientists in natural language processing. Uh, some of the amazing works have happened at Facebook, like Fast Text and all, which happened um, um, at Fair Paris. Uh, um, like we have very good presence in Paris as well and London and New York uh, and MPK. So, so there's a lot of freedom. There are a lot of areas you can contribute to um, as long as, you know, you, you're, you're kind of publishing and you're kind of, you are developing expertise in these areas and kind of moving the state of the art ahead. Um, and this is where these collaborations come in. Facebook really encourages um, you to have collaborations with academia uh, where they are happy to, you know, uh, sponsor research projects in universities uh, where we support PhD students um, and where we give research grants to PhD students and to um, kind of uh, faculty at universities to conduct research that is state of the art because eventually it advances the state of the art, but it also helps Facebook kind of, um, you know, um, gain gain a lot of knowledge from how we can really improve AI uh, instead of just kind of, you know, inbreeding ideas and, and not really uh, kind of coming up with innovative stuff. So, so these research grants actually come from Facebook. Uh, they are encouraged by Facebook and I personally encourage a lot of research scientists in Facebook to actually form these collaborations because it gives that, you know, extra dimension to innovation where you, you may be thinking of Facebook problems, but academics are thinking broader or thinking more freely or thinking more kind of um, out of the world things, out of the box things, you know, uh, uh, really kind of thinking 10 steps ahead and you can really form a virtuous cycle there. I mean, this really sounds a bit like the dream for someone who's a bit kind of s stuck in the decision between a research mm -hmm. and uh, making money, essentially. I mean, industry. That sounds like a bit like the dream because you also like your salary is comparable to a software engineering salary. Yes. So, yes. It's the I mean, same bands. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> that's really cool. And I mean, this, this all sounds also a bit like a Facebook ad. It's not a paid ad, <laughs> I, I, I assure the audience. And to prove that point, let's talk a bit about ethics. Because you talked a lot about like good AI and mm -hmm. like how um, fighting abusive behavior and doing moral things. And um, I, th this sounds amazing, and I agree with mm -hmm. that. Uh, out there in the world, mm -hmm. when, people hear, hear, when people hear Facebook and then artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. they don't always jump to ethics. Right. That's the third, third word. Now, you even, 
back in the days, even before joining Facebook, mm -hmm. I saw on Facebook, on your profile, that you wrote, you wrote this long rant mm -hmm. about, I don't know if you remember, like a long yes. post about fake news about Facebook, essentially. Yes. Yes. And you're, you're a strong... Uh, you, you very, very strongly proclaimed how uh, Facebook does actually amazing things in this space. So give us the, I don't know, the summary. Why, or, or explain a bit what's your take on this. Why is there a bit of a mismatch, at mm -hmm. least in my perception, a mismatch between how the media and the general public perceive what Facebook does and the ethics of what Facebook does and then... When, when I hear a pitch like this, it sounds like ethics, like kind of, not not even something we don't ignore, but something we actually put at the head, center and the heart of those projects. Right. No, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things I would say here is, as Facebook has grown uh, over the years, a lot of these things we did not have an understanding of. You know, AI is a new field after all. It's been 20 years um, since AI really started growing, right? And the big data, like there was a dot-com boom and then the big data revolution, right? So in uh, around 2010, you really have like machine learning algorithms coming up, which can um, learn from uh, like especially deep, deep, uh, deep uh, neural networks coming up, which can really learn amazing things from data, right? And before that, we did not have computers that could actually support this kind of learning. We did not have the processing power to do it at scale. And when we did have, like, you know, 2010 onwards, like, we see a sudden increase in kind of deep neural networks and deep learning and all of that. Um, that's when this field starts growing. But this field does not only start growing for Facebook. It just grows crazily all over the world, right? So Google is doing it. Amazon is doing it. Uh, Facebook is doing it. And everybody is investing in AI because it's really... Um, as, as these platforms grow, they really need scalable solutions and humans don't scale very well, right? We are very good at doing uh, things, um, but we are very bad at scaling ourselves, right? So we can't, we can't do, um, we, we, we can think amazing things, but we can't apply that thinking to a thousand things. Um, so, so that's why how AI has been growing and because of its fast growth, there have been blind spots everywhere in the industry. It's not specific to Facebook, um, there are many problems that arise on Facebook because of being a social network. There are other problems that arise on Google because of being, you know, the search engine part of Google. There are other problems that arise on on um, Amazon because of how they recommend products and so on. Um, this I don't feel is fundamentally about a company. Any company, like if it were in Facebook, there would be some other social media which would have eventually decided we need to do AI to be able to scale and they would have hit similar roadblocks of kind of, uh, you know, the issues that exist and how usage of AI to scale also amplifies those issues. So that is why I often kind of, I, I do want to make sure that we understand, you know, there are some fundamental problems when a new technology comes up and we learn about it and we improve it. And worse is, did Facebook necessarily want to use AI in a bad way? I don't think Facebook has ever wanted to do that. Um, it's just the nature of the field being new and the way companies, uh, the way it grew and the way the demand grew for for kind of accessing these services. Um, that that uh, you know that there there is this mismatch in trust between users and companies and how their data is used. But over time, I feel like you know Facebook is Facebook and all other companies are really putting a lot of kind of emphasis on what we call responsible AI. Right, and which is something I'm working on now. So I changed teams uh, two weeks back, and I switched to responsible AI because I do feel it's a very important endeavor. Responsible AI—that's very interesting. And I think one point here is really, really critical: that the the intention part. Like, yes, that's where I feel like a hundred percent I agree. Um, I it really annoys me when mm -hmm. out there it's portrayed it's portrayed as if these companies would kind of like be doing bad things. Right on purpose exactly. that's just ridiculous like yeah. that's it's, it's unrealistic mm -hmm. and uh, it, it it becomes immediately clear when joining this kind of company that that's just not the case that's just that not. these like i mean op, up to people like mark zuckerberg who obviously is not, is not no longer in for the money mm. because he has enough <laughs> um but really just driven and passionate about making the world a better place yes. and then you can analyze and say okay do i agree that 
this is moving in the right direction. Right. And that that's where it becomes really tricky because uh, there are a lot of dilemmas involved and there are a lot of trade-offs involved. Mm -hmm. Like for the the one of the most prominent ones is the trade-off between safety and free speech, right? Yes. And freedom. Yes. So and this is I I guess maybe unavoidable, mm -hmm. but this is something that I, bothers me sometimes and I could expect that maybe this is something you also think about because we work, I work in integrity, you work on research, mm -hmm. responsible AI say, mm -hmm. but um, you work a lot on the detection and kind of the technical mm -hmm. aspect or like detecting abusive behavior, detecting bad content, mm -hmm. but you don't decide what that actually means for Facebook, right? We have like community standards, we have an exactly. oversight board, we have a policy team. Mm -hmm. We aren't on the policy team. So that's actually interesting because like when you talk to people and like, oh yeah, I fight bad behavior, bad content, they're like, how do you decide what's allowed, what isn't? And then you're like, oh right, actually I don't really make that choice. Mm. So then there's also the question, are you like happy with how, how the company decides? Like how much do you trust it yourself? How do you identify what if the company using your technology or your, mm. your, your mathematical methods delete stuff that you think shouldn't be deleted? Mm. And where do you position yourself? Because uh, there'll be people within Facebook and outside Facebook saying we should be really safe, like delete everything that just seems slightly racist um, or delete, ban Donald Trump's account, where mm -hmm. Donald, Donald Trump's account. Uh, and then there'll be others that say freedom of speech, leave everything, it's an open mm -hmm. marketplace. People should just be able to communicate and sort it out themselves. Mm -hmm. How do you, is it something you, think about do you feel like that do you feel that is a problem or not at all that there's kind of this disconnect between policy makers inside the company and outside and technical solutions yeah that's a great question and um yeah sometimes you can feel like you know you, you you're um kind of working on ai and uh you may not have con yeah you're designing the intelligence but you're not designing the enforcement, right? So you're, you're kind of designing what gets detected, but how it's dealt with is a policy matter. So you might feel like, okay, I designed the system. I wanted to detect um, this as hate speech. You may, uh, you may, you may consider this hate, hate speech and um, you may be convinced that, okay, my system is good because it can, it can detect this and I'm happy with the system. And when, you know, it starts detecting uh, the poli uh, policy policy, or, or kind of, you know, w w ultimately it comes back that, okay, no, we, we may be too strict or we may be too lenient or so on, right? So how do we calibrate that system um, to, to suit the policy? So there is certainly the, the, these things operate at different levels, as you said, you know, that there might be disconnects. But what I do see, uh, which is happening now, is that we are becoming more and more open about our standards, right? So we are becoming more and more open. We are becoming more and more auditable. And the whole of big tech, I would say, is becoming more and more auditable in terms of like, what are the policies, right? How do you deem something um, hate speech? How do you deem something misinformation? And um, we are kind of, uh, Facebook as a company is inviting a lot of external auditors or like allowing um, things like, oversight board to to for appeal of decisions when something is taken down or something is uh, uh something is not taken down either way so this gives me more confidence that okay there is more objectivity to the process um and kind of um that helps me make more sense of what is the where do where does my work sit in this whole stack of something got detected something got taken down something got appealed something, um, you know, was decided, where does my work fit in this whole pipeline of detection versus enforcement? Um, but yeah, I think there is still um, some way to go in kind of making sure we have a complete uh, auditable and transparent AI system um, that can be understood by anybody and everybody. And that is also part of responsible AI, which is to say every stakeholder who interacts with these systems, be it the auditors, be it the users, be it the developers, they should have complete transparency into end-to-end -end working of um, these kind of AI systems. Interesting. I think that's a, that's that's a really interesting area. Transparency mm -hmm. in AI yes. is definitely a problem. Even just from like a 
privacy perspective. It's almost like, oh, what data do you store? And can you just delete it? And right. usually the answer is you can't, right? You just have like trained models that kind of like implicitly know all these things, but you mm. can't just look it up yeah. like in a database. And uh, it's sometimes really hard to understand why a machine learning model made a certain decision yeah. or why it didn't. Yeah. And that's a really, really interesting research area. Absolutely. I also think it's a really good, um, I think that's a good tendency to kind of just kind of give these kind of decisions back to the general uh, democratic debate. Mm -hmm. Like I really like the oversight board decision, yeah. which is uh, for those who don't know, it's kind of uh, saying, let's let people decide who are not employed by Facebook, people of the public, university professors, etc. let them have an influence on what is allowed on Facebook yes. and isn't. And I think that's a great move. It's still, of course, in the end, and, and that's sometimes hard to accept. It, not every decision you might personally agree with. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think also like you have to be careful that sometimes it's very easy to portray something mm -hmm. as a bad or immoral decision. Mm -hmm. Like in the same scenario, you could uh, like when the, a piece of hate speech gets deleted or doesn't get deleted, mm -hmm. you could either say Facebook suppressing opinions or Facebook mm -hmm. censoring stuff, or you could say Facebook is spreading hate speech or misinformation. Mm -hmm. Like it always depends on your angle. Right. And um, we often, I see internal posts on the internal Facebook forums, workplace, mm -hmm. uh, where people like posting a screenshot, how can this be allowed? And mm -hmm. they're like really offended by it mm -hmm. because it offends their religion or their mm -hmm. gender or something. And mm -hmm. then there'd be others like uh, maybe protesting, why do we delete stuff? And mm -hmm. everyone has their own position there on the spectrum. I'm actually, for example, more of a liberal in the original right. sense of the word. I do not like uh, that we banned Donald Trump. It's just personally, I don't agree with the decision, uh, mm -hmm. even though I strongly disagree with what Donald Trump posted. Mm -hmm. But um, I accept that there's like the certain debate and right. I accept that that actually might have a majority even outside Facebook that right. um, to ban that. Mm -hmm. So this is this is all really interesting. Um, and clearly uh, it's, it's amazing that we have smart people like you doing uh, amazing work there and uh, obviously also career was doing very well. Now, one thing that I noticed when I was kind of preparing for this and like looking at your CV, mm -hmm. um, you, even though you are like, have this amazing career right now, you got rejected at first from a bunch of universities. You mm. applied to, I think, Cambridge and the MIT and you had this dream of getting into some elite university mm -hmm. and you did, you, you got a rejection. Mm -hmm. But then you didn't just go away and, studied at some random university, mm. you actually said, no, like you, you didn't just accept that. Mm. Um, tell us a bit about that process because I think that's really interesting and inspiring right. that you just didn't take the rejection. You just said, okay, I'm gonna try again. Right. Yeah, that, that I think is, um, you know, when I look back, um, that decision of mine, I do think um, uh, was a decision hard to take. Uh, it wasn't easy, you know, like, um, so I, I, I was in final, final year of my school, uh, grade 12, a uh, high school. And I decided, okay, I, I want to go abroad. Like I want to apply to universities in the UK and in the U S because I wanted to do more of, um, pure, uh, like I wanted to do more mathematically motivated computer science. I'm like kind of more, um, a little bit more on the theory side of stuff. Um, and like in um like back home um a lot of focus is on engineering like there are some amazing institutes for pure sciences um but a lot of uh, focus in india um is is kind of on engineering but i wanted to do more uh, pure computer science uh but now there are amazing institutes uh doing pure computer science and like kind of you know these are coming up and uh, and that's good but Back then, I wanted to kind of, you know, um, apply to, to places in UK and in the UK and the US, uh, which focused more on kind of um, a math based uh, approach, like kind of, you know, ma math uh, or motivated approaches uh, to computer science. And um, so, like, kind of, I applied uh, to a bunch of universities in the US and kind of, um, also, uh, in the UK and I got into, uh, I did not get into most of them. <laughs> that is, that is how I would say I, I got rejected from Stanford, from MIT, from, uh, from Berkeley, you name it. Uh, any of the top universities I tried, uh, my luck, I got rejected. Um, in the UK, I got rejected from Cambridge. I did get into Imperial. 
But personally, um, two institutes I really wanted to be at, um, I mean, like kind of either would, would work, were MIT and Cambridge because their undergraduate programs, and especially um, their history, has had seen a lot of contribution to math. And you've been a math uh, student at Cambridge and you know, like, you know, the history of it. Um, so I really wanted to kind of, you know, uh, be at one of these two places. They were kind of my really uh, top choices when it comes to what I really wanted to study. Um, so <clears throat> I got I got rejected from these two and the option was to kind of go for um, go for um, go to Imperial, which is a great institute, by the way. But just I was so hung up on on kind of this dream that there's an interesting story to it, you know. So in our in our final year, we have to do our uh, exams, what we call our grade uh, twelve exams um, or board exams, as we call them in India. And so <clears throat> I I applied to Imp I applied to all these institutes before I got results. So you give predicted results, right? And you get a conditional offer. Mm. So I got rejected from Cambridge. I got rejected from MIT. But from Imperial, I got a conditional offer. And I got a conditional offer. Um, and it said, okay, you are um, you have to get 90 in this subject, 90 in this subject, and so on. So I have five subjects. And they gave conditions that you need to get overall this percentage in your examinations and this per subject. Off one of those conditions, um, I missed one. Uh, which was like I had to get above 90 in physics. I think I got 87, if I remember correctly. And uh, b when your board results come, you can also access your mark sheet and you can see where you made mistakes. And you can apply for kind of uh, rechecking of the paper if you believe something was not marked properly. And I tried to convince my parents. By that time, Imperial, uh, like all other institutes, had rejected me. And uh, like kind of, you know, Imperial uh, was the top choice that I had. And I told my parents, you know, I really want to go to Cambridge or MIT, so maybe I want to reapply. And they were very pissed, like they were not comfortable with this, you know, like, because gap year, taking a gap year is a big gamble. You don't know if you'll get in again, or like you, you're putting in a whole year and you don't have that kind of, and especially in, you know, in my mm -hmm. head, in my head now I have, uh, it's, it's cliche, I'm sorry. Yeah, go for but it. I have like these Indian parents proud but strict Indian parents in my head like uh, for example in Big Bang Theory right you know like Raj in, <laughs> right in this you know, like they he always video with them. Mm. that's that's my image just say if it does if it doesn't fit you have to correct it no I mean for most part uh, this is the truth right like um, um for, for, like India is a big country and there's so much competition you you want to get it right in the first go there are like very few second chances that you get in a country like India with like so many good people aspiring for you know, a bunch of resources. So they were not very comfortable with this idea. So what do what did what did I do? Uh, I had to do something. So um, one way was if I missed the imperial offer, uh, then they would say, okay, then you are left with nothing. So you should reapply. And that's what I did. I never um, uh, gave that paper uh, in which I missed the condition for rechecking, even though I knew. I would, if I did give it for rechecking, I would probably get three, four marks more because I knew some questions hadn't been marked properly. But that would put me above uh, the conditional offer line and I would have to, you know, wow. go to Imperial. So I never <laughs> did that. And eventually Imperial rejected me to my absolute pleasure. Wow. So you could, wow, that, that, that's so funny. So you, uh, you didn't, Get those get get those mark uh, marks checked, just so you had the leverage talking yes. to your parents that you didn't have any offer left, so you had to wait a year yeah. and play again to Cambridge yeah. because otherwise your proud Indian parents would have pushed you to join Imperial College, which is which is a great which university, is a great institute, one of the best in the yeah. UK. Just I was hung up like it's, Imperial is great, it's doing great work. Just that you know you you have your choices. It's still funny though that you couldn't just like you you took the easier way. You didn't just say no, I won't apply. <laughs> you just kind of made it so that it's, it won't yeah. be even a possibility. What do you do? Like, what can... Uh, they were sad. Yeah. So was I, at least on my face. But... Um, they must be extremely happy now, though. They're happy, Things yeah. worked out yeah. well. Yeah. And then that's the year I went to IOI um, as, as part... Uh, Which is the International Olympiad, Olympiad for Informatics. Correct. Um, and that was a big part in my admission to Cambridge. Uh, they really recognized it. Uh, it helped me with the interviews again and the entrance exams to Cambridge, um, like all of, you know, kind of 
some are algorithms based some are math based but you really de- develop these skills when you're preparing for sport programming competitions uh, especially for IOI it's very theoretic uh, like uh, you really need to understand algorithms and you really need to be uh, good at math did you get invited for interview to cambridge in the first round i did so you uh, so basically it was the interview performance uh, why you didn't get in to so cambridge. um actually actually the way it happened is that uh, so cambridge when it uh, at, at least at that time when it was doing interviews in india they would give you two places to interview either you fly to cambridge or you fly to uh, one of the locations closer to india to do the interview and so i said i'm fine with either but um eventually i decided i couldn't travel to cambridge because it was like you know my board exams were coming up and i couldn't um couldn't fly out and take the exam so i said okay i would prefer having an interview uh closer to home and that is a more competitive pool because you know more people from india are applying and they everyone wants to get interviewed mm. close to home so eventually i never got invited for interview close to home and i couldn't fly so i never did the interview or oh, so you didn't get invited for interview yeah ultimately i didn't get invited interesting so there are multiple rounds first yes. cambridge said we'd be interested to interview you but yeah. then you didn't make another round yeah. of decision yeah. there okay so you, we can't know if that if you would have how how your interview performance would yeah, have been without the ioi experience but certainly that helped that tell, helped. tell me a bit like you flew out to cambridge mm-hmm. in the second year yes and uh, how was that like cambridge interviews everyone talks about it i never did one ah. because i only did part two as a oh, visiting yes. student yes. and then i did part three for which i applied regularly but there are no interviews Yeah, Cambridge interviews are interesting. Like um I really like that part of of the process because it it adds, you know, um uh like when you take tests, those are very mechanical, right? You go, you uh, you take a test and you get some marks. And there's very little that you l- kind of you learn for the test, but there's very little part of um human interaction in that process, right? But interviews, Cambridge interviews are designed to kind of not just test you but also let you get a feel of what cambridge is about so you visit cambridge or you visit any other location where they are doing interviews you interact with students you have like uh students take you around and like show you the college and the college life and uh then you finally have like two to three interviews where you're talking to either your director of studies your future director of studies or some professor or some some academic from from the area that you're kind of um you're applying for so when you apply to cambridge you apply for a subject unlike us universities where you apply in most places you don't specify a major beforehand but when you apply to cambridge you do specify uh what you want to study right and then you get interviewed and you take written tests and so on and cambridge interviews i did two of them the oh, first one was more about like kind of um uh, one was uh more of natural sciences because i wanted to do cs plus natural sciences So one was about physics and we were just discussing some if i remember correctly some problem so we did some problem solving that some discussion on on some uh some laws of motion if i remember correctly and it was a good discussion <clears throat> but it was not just like kind of trying to understand what um like just under, uh, kind of evaluate me but it was also to give me a feel of how things at cambridge work like what are you encouraged to do like you know independent thinking and kind of finding your own way through through kind of problems that may not be solved or that may not be fully solved or understood so that was that was one interview the other interview was more cs specific where we were kind of discussing um we started by discussing if i remember correctly um the binary system right so the binary system of uh of uh numbers and then kind of uh, how we slowly build machines out of it all the way right so So that was a very interesting discussion and there they're just kind of you know trying to have a conversation with you to just really understand your thinking process uh not necessarily be like okay you you got this wrong you got this right that is the test part right the communication part is more to understand your thinking procedure not necessarily your right or wrong so there there will be questions they ask that they don't know answers to but just to see how you approach a problem that is known to not be solved um kind of thing so it's it's a very interesting process uh it's a bit daunting 
Um, but I would say in the end, it's really enriching. My trip to Cambridge when I did the interview was absolutely like I knew returning from the trip that if I get in, this is where I really want to be. So, yeah. Amazing. It would have been very disappointing if you hadn't got in then. Yeah, yeah. It was, I, I told my parents the same, like once I visited Cambridge, I absolutely knew mm. I wanted to. It's such, a, it's such a magical place. Well. It is, yeah. So how was the process then? You flew back to India. How long did it take for you to actually get accepted? And did you, because I never fully understood this, it's all on the website, but did you get into a specific college immediately? And did you, because you, you said you do it with your mm -hmm. future director of studies, mm -hmm. so, so you apply for a college. Mm -hmm. But then isn't it a disadvantage for example, to apply to a very competitive college. Right. How does that work? How, so is it a bit of a gamble? That's a great question. So what Cambridge really um, tries to do is, um, so, so, so the way Cambridge works is like, um, and you probably know this, but for, for everyone who doesn't, um, you know, there, there's the university, of course, uh, which, is uh, which is, you know, composed of the departments and the colleges and the libraries and all of that stuff. And then, um, so colleges are just a part of Cambridge, right? So um, you, uh, uh, colleges mostly provide you with pastoral care, place to live, resources to study. And then uh, most of the teaching is um, done by the department, right? So lectures are by the department. And sometimes most of the supervisions in your final years are by the department as well. Um, and in the first two years of your tripos, they, they can be arranged by your um, by your colleges respectively, but the last year, um, when it's like the final year, uh, it's arranged by the department to make sure everyone has same access to resources uh, for, for their degree examinations. So when the process starts, you can pick up a college and you most people pick up colleges based on like what they like about living at that college, right? So some people prefer on-site gym, some people don't care about gym, some people want to live close to the river, some people prefer being close to where their department is because they don't want to travel a lot. Um, so when I applied um, to Cambridge, I applied open, which is another uh, option that Cambridge mm -hmm. gives you that you don't pick a college. They will just um, put you um, there. So that was the first time. And so then you I got, got pulled, yes. as I say. Yes. And you got pulled into Hufflepuff, if I remember correctly. Homerton, Homerton. sorry. <laughs> right? Yeah, that yeah. is the college, Homerton. It, uh, it, is, it is the Hufflepuff. It is. It is. Cambridge, yeah. It is the Hufflepuff. We do the, um, we do the um, Harry Potter formal as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like one of the f uh, f colleges, that, like not in the center. It's so far away. It is. I had dancing lessons at Homerton. Oh, you did? So I was very to good cycle dance, there. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was my uh, fitness regime at, at Cambridge. Just being at Homerton, you have to be fit. Like you have right. to cy cycle all the way to computer science. <laughs> so I understand when you do an open application, but mm -hmm. that, that was one thing I was always wondering right. when you, isn't it like a really risky decision to say, I apply f for maths at Trinity, for example, right. because like all the other people, it'd be really competitive. Is that true? Like, is it more difficult? Uh, like, could you... And then you wouldn't get into Cambridge at all because just because you chose too ambitiously a college. No, that doesn't happen actually that way. Uh, so if you do apply to Cambridge uh, to do Trinity, which happens to be a favorite for Mathmos, or you know, there every college has certain subject legacy, right? So Mathmo being the Cambridge term for yes, mathematical student. Yeah. That is true. So um, if if you are apply to Trinity and yeah, there happens to be a large number of people who apply to Trinity and they tend to be very good because just you know, history um, has gone that way. So um, what happens is you do get evaluated by Trinity. If you're deemed to be of um, meeting Cambridge standards, right, so of admissions, whatever those standards are for your subject, um, you will not be rejected by Trinity, mm -hmm. even if they don't have places. You will be put in a common pool from where other colleges can pick you up and interview you and give you a place in so you have to do another round of interviews? Not always. It depends if okay. there is enough signal that, Trin let's say, Trinity got out of you, they write a report, and based on that report, Interesting. other college can just pick you up, or they can choose to interview you the third time. So after two interviews, you can have a third interview, mm -hmm. and uh, then they can choose to have you in case they want to further, f you know, just have a communication with you, not right. just based on reports from some other college. So in this 
fictitious example, Trinity, mm. which is my college, but yes. I sneaked in as a visiting <laughs> student, so I didn't have to do the interview. Right. So they could either say, amazing, we take them. Yes. Or really good, you don't have to interview them again. Just not quite good enough for, for, for Trinity. Right. Or they could say, quite good, but you might want to do another interview, essentially. Sure. Or they could re reject exactly, you. Exactly. And also one more thing I would say is it's not just, uh, I mean, Cambridge colleges also try to maintain um, diversity of people coming in. Mm. And they also want to make sure there's a good ratio of internationals to non-internationals. Oh. So there can be many reasons you're put in the- Affirmative program. action in the Cambridge <laughs> hiring process. So, um, so you know, the, every college wants to create a dynamic community. And in that case, the, uh, it, can, it may be that uh, amazing, we accept you. Amazing, we cannot accept you because we've accepted a lot of- uh similar people so maybe your background like if you have a lot sorry of we had we had too many asians already really? yeah or too many internationals mm. we need to you know um kind of balance it out uh and that's a good thing uh creating a you know diverse community really helps um so that can be another reason for why you may be put in the pool um but yeah uh, if you're good um you will probably get in one way or the other into cambridge uh, and which college you get can dictate your college life, but it does not necessarily dictate quality of education. You get the same quality of education regardless. Interesting. So for you, the gap year, the gap year really paid off. It, it was a fantastic decision. So. Now, what's funny though, and what I have to talk about is Please. how I know about the gap year. Please tell. How do I know about your gap year? Oh my god! Because yes. you are, uh, you used to be quite active on Quora. Yes, and. I understand that part that you were ask, answering questions on Quora. Now the weird part is people mm -hmm. asking questions about you. Yeah. So there were like Quora threads with like quite a few votes. Um, how did Put Pushka Mishra plan for his gap year? Yeah. And another one was how did Pushka Mishra become good at programming? Mm -hmm. So what is this hype? How do these people know you? Why people don't ask questions about me on Quora? I think I sometimes Google myself and I find interesting forum threads. But mm -hmm. what what happened? Who was that? <laughs> I think it has got a lot to do with um, these competitions, you know? So programming competitions, and that's how I think I got noticed by people. And then eventually, I think IOI, because it's like uh, four people are representing a country. Um, so so you were one of four people yes, representing yes. India, yes, which is a lot of people. At IOI 2014, yes, in Taiwan. I see. So that is, I think... Uh, my claim to fame, for, uh, at least for Quora purposes. Right. So you are a celebrity in the well, niche area of competitive coding and at least science, yeah. but still, yeah. that is really really funny. You know, you're no longer really active in like Quora, Twitter, all these things, right? Because you have like this long history. Of course, I was like going at that and uh, trying to find interesting pieces of information. Yeah, um, I've I've kind of mellowed it down a bit because now just mostly working on research papers is my thing. <laughs> Um, so I don't write on Quora that much. But that is another reason I wanted to kind of talk to you is like, since I don't write that much um, and your channel is like kind of really coming up and I thought uh, it's a good way to kind of dis disseminate some of the knowledge that about these processes to kind of, you know, help people out there. You should start a podcast. <laughs> or we should do it jointly. Or, or a YouTube channel. Maybe we should. Um, we should um, also... I really want to do an office tour eventually. You mm. you are working from the office now. Yes. You told me. And mm. things are slowly getting back to normal, even though that Facebook is, is very conservative about mm. it. Um, I also really miss the old BFF times. Mm. Pushka, I, I really associate you with BFFs. <laughs> um, I always, I, I, I tell, I've told people uh, in the past, I think that our, I'm not sure on this channel though, like there's this thing uh, at Facebook where we used to, which we used to do is where you can do social activities, yes. bonding with yes. coworkers and the company would contribute some money to it. So yes. you could go and like create an event and go have food in a restaurant or go to a cinema mm. or even to a club or a bar mm. and uh, Facebook would pay 25 pounds per person, yeah. um, which is an amazing perk. It's really yeah. cool. It's not in the end of the day, it's just money and mm -hmm. it, it if you just if you sum it up it's not that much money that they actually mm -hmm. spend on you per month mm -hmm. compared with the salary and other benefits but it just mm -hmm. sounds really cool when you tell people oh yeah i just go to the cinema for free i just mm -hmm. go to the restaurant for free all of these mm -hmm. and you were quite the expert mm -hmm. uh, on utilizing that perk and i remember that our internship year was the last 
where interns were allowed to do that without full-time employee attendance. And uh, maybe you, you had a bit of a role in there. So I do look forward to um, getting back into that and uh, yeah. yeah, having all of these dinners. It, it is an interesting program. And by the way, I'll, I'll correct you a little bit. It's no more 25 pounds. It, before office closed down because of COVID, it went up to 28 inflation. Really? Yeah. 28 pounds. 28 pounds. But I think it's a That's great That's a few perk. ranks, yeah. even in London. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think it's a good perk because a lot of contacts I made at Facebook, and I think one one of the things that Facebook really encourages, um, and you have been kind of um, a beneficiary of that, is mobility, right? So you can change teams easily. You can change roles with you know Which a I certain did. level of ease. And knowing people and knowing their perspectives or what they work on or just having these connections and, you know, kind of um, talking to a wide uh, variety of, and, and as Facebook grows, knowing what people work on becomes harder, right? Or what projects are happening. And I think for, for the amount that Facebook is investing, this is a great perk because uh, not only does it help people make connections within Facebook, of course, increasing the value that the company has in their lives, but at the same time, it's also good for the company because um, uh, kind of uh, it's also good for the people and uh, in, in the sense that they get to know um, a lot more perspectives of what is really happening out there. You know, like what are people working on? Like what is the cutting edge of, uh, let's say, portal or what is the cutting edge of AI or what is the cutting edge of what are integrity efforts? And how would you know that? Like, would you ever go out of your way to book uh, a meeting with some random person on an area you don't work on, that would probably not happen. But if they happen to be in a common place because, you know, of such an event, that's how you would know, right? And I mean, in the end of the day, as you said, it's not that much money, yes. but it sounds really cool. But I mean, <clears throat> most people would like go maybe to BFF event every one or two weeks. Exactly. Well, there are, there are people who <laughs> do it every single day of the internship, <laughs> but even 25 pounds a day, isn't that much money if you think about it? Exactly. It's a lot of money, but if you if you had twenty five pounds a day more on your salary, that would feel much less nice exactly. than having this perk where you're like when you go and have pizza for free and have drinks for free and go to the cinema for free, you feel like oh wow, I'm living the life. Yeah. This company is treating me so well. It's like free food in the office. Yes, it's such a selling point. You have visitors come in, uh, they look at the buffet and they're like, wow, you get this for free. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And it's so much stronger a selling point than just having a bit more money. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Which is which is really interesting. But yeah, I also really look forward to it. And you are living all of this life and you're going to have all of these perks again, yet doing amazing academic research. Really, I think you found like a sweet spot there. It's really, really interesting. Um, what's your long-term plan? Could you imagine going back to university and actually become a professor? Because also that's so interesting. You can actually work, make bank at Facebook, uh, like enjoy this lifestyle, and then you can still go to university and be, become a fellow, become a professor. Is that an option for you or do you see yourself in the corporate world forever? That's a that's a great question. And <clears throat> talking of uh, long term plans, I do feel like you know what really interests me, uh, uh, and I think it will still interest me ten years down the line is kind of pushing the state of the art for AI, right? And a lot of things are changing even in academia today, right? So um, it's no more like, uh, especially in AI. AI is a field where academics are also kind of you know, being recognized for exceptional work by universities and kind of they are bringing in a lot of these contracts where, um, uh, you know, with, with industry and, and kind of, you know, getting rewarded for it. So uh, so it's it's creating a virtuous cycle where it's no more like, you know, there are two levels of people, like one industrial researchers and one academic, like we're kind of closing the loop on this, you know, and kind of making an ecosystem that comprises of um, all these these people and they get uh, rewarded for the work they do. And um, so w one thing I, I, I'll tell you here is, you know, my my manager, uh, ex-manager who just moved out of Facebook, he uh, went, he has just gone and joined University of Rome, La Sapienza, as a full-time professor. Uh, so That's he so moved cool. straight from Facebook and uh, he was a senior manager here. And he would have probably become a director in a year or two. Um, and he chose to go to ac um, academia because uh, he can still con uh, collaborate with industries uh, because industries, uh, you know, industries, um, especially 
uh, big tech like Facebook and Google and parts of Facebook like Facebook AI and parts of Google like DeepMind, they're encouraging these kind of uh, kind of collaborations. So he he's quite confident that he can get that even at university and still feel kind of rewarded for his work. So I do feel at some point I may consider that because <clears throat> it's like, you know, university has a lot of other things and like you have more freedom or, and you can pick and choose different kind of areas and different companies you want to collaborate with. And you can collaborate with uh, more students and kind of, you know, you're in that ecosystem and that's interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't kind of, you know, made a st- Uh, like a strong decision on whether I definitely want to go into academia. What I definitely know is I do want to remain in research and I do want to make sure year after year uh, that I'm kind of pushing the state of the art on this, be it from industry or academia. Amazing. I look, I really look forward to following that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was so, so interesting. I think we had a a bunch of great topics, a lot of Mm -hmm. great questions and uh, yeah, Pushka, it's been such a pleasure. Thank, Thank you so you. much to Thank be, you so for much. being on my show. Of course. Pleasure is all mine. Das war mein Kumpel und Arbeitskollege Pushka. Mega interessanter Typ, wie ich finde. Ich hoffe, es hat euch gefallen. Schreibt mir eure Meinung in die YouTube-Kommentare. Macht es gut und bis nächste Woche. Musik